All right, guys. Uh, so welcome to my brief introduction to cryptography. In this short lecture, I'm going to tell you a couple of things about the history and the basic concepts behind <clears throat> modern uh, and not so modern cryptography. Uh, note that some things might be simplified for sake of this lecture. I just didn't want to talk about algebra, just the concepts. All right, moving slides doesn't work. Okay. So the first question is, uh, why would we spend time on cryptography? Well, to share sensitive information. That's the first natural answer. But it's not the only one. Uh, in modern cryptography, we may encode information, but it also has tools to let us authorize ourselves in various scenarios. For example, digital payments. <coughs> But let's go back in time for a while and um, see how it all started. So the first uh, usage of, of cryptography that is worth mentioning was in ancient Rome by the well-known Caesar. And the Caesar used the cipher to pass military sensitive information uh, by his own cipher, which was pretty weak. And note that if someone figured out how to do a Caesar cipher, he would send fake messages, which would be taken seriously since, well, they were, they were encrypted, right? <clears throat> and the cipher itself uh, is based on alphabet shift. As I said, not very sophisticated, but it was ancient Rome, so come on. Uh, so basically, as you can see in uh, this picture, uh, we, when we do the encryption, we just uh, move each letter in an alphabet. So the A becomes X, B becomes Y, C becomes Z, uh, etc., etc. So in scientific notation, uh, this is how the encryption and decryption functions look like. So basically to encrypt uh, letter X, we use the key N, which is basically the shift. Uh, we add these values and do the modulo 26 operation. 26 because there are 26 characters uh, in the alphabet. As I said, uh, Caesar cipher is pretty weak since it's vulnerable to frequency analysis. As we seen here, uh, each letter is always uh, encrypted to to other certain letters. So if we know that, for example, in English, the most frequent letter is A, right? Is it? Let's say it is. Then we, if we have long enough, the long enough ciphertext, we can count the occurrences of each letters and do the mapping, right? And it will give great results. Uh, but also, as you may notice, there are only 26 possible keys because the alphabet is pretty small, right? So we can just try uh, all of the configurations and yeah, the, the cipher text. The, the cipher can be broken by only knowing the, the cipher text. <clears throat> well, there, much, there was not much improvement uh, until the Enigma machine, which is still breakable, and the 70s of last century, which is the modern cryptography, uh, which is the time when the modern cryptography was born. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, there was this visionaire, visionaire cipher. Sorry, the guy was French, so I don't know how to pronounce his name. And this cipher was pretty neat. It was a predecessor to one time pad. And it was resist resistant to simple, simple frequency analysis because the key was a word. And if message was longer than the key, which was also the cases, the key was just concatenated multiple times. And for this one and the one time pad, uh, the encryption and decryption process you may think of that it's uh, that the plain text is a stream of bits the key is a stream of bits. And to do the cipher, you just uh, XOR the bits, the pair of bits, right? 
Okay, but let's talk about the quantum path, which is really interesting one. Uh, this is the only cipher that cannot be broken, no matter how much computational power you, you get. If it's applied properly, which is provable, uh, it cannot be broken, but it is highly cumbersome in practical usage. So when we apply these three rules uh, to the usage of one time path, it is perfectly secure. But in the real world, it is highly difficult to generate truly random key, share the key in a secure way, etc. Uh, yeah, and the third property is that we can only use the key once. Thank you. All right. But okay, if, let's assume that we are able to generate proper, truly random key for the for the algorithm, uh, and this is what, what we get in the mathematical notation. This is equally probable for two distinct messages that they will give the same the same cipher text, and that implies that if we have given cipher text and we try to decode that with every possible key, it will be equally probable that the original text was any message of that length. Those that make sense on, and those that do not make any sense. But still, uh, even if you go through all of the keys, you, you only know the length of the message, right? But you can try to do some sneaky stuff and add some random, uh, characters to, to, to make the message, uh, to, to, to change the, the length of the message. All right, um, let's move on to the modern cryptography in which we don't hide any details on how the algorithm works and the only secret is the key. And the security of these algorithms are based on computational complexity. And as we know from the previous lecture, some problems would take some really long time to solve, right? And basically, there are three topics that I want to uh, talk about today. The symmetrical cryptography, in which I will just briefly describe two most notable algorithms, uh, the hash functions, and the asymmetrical cryptography. And starting with the symmetrical cryptography, uh, well, in the early 70s, the NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, uh, they had identified a need for a standard for encrypting sensitive uh, information. Well, it turned out that the IBM uh, developed such an algorithm and that became uh, DES, which is Data Encryption Standard. It was in 1975. And so the input for the algorithm was the plain text and the 56 bits uh, long key. And the message was cut into blocks to fit the key length, and each block was encrypted separately in 16 rounds of Feistel function, so called Feistel function. Uh, yeah, and eventually the DES was broken and uh, NIST again needed a reliable encryption standard. And this is where the advanced encryption standard comes in, which was developed in 1998. Uh, this one is also a block algorithm, but this time in certain implementations, uh, previously encrypted blocks are part of encryption for incoming blocks. And also, the key length may vary between 128 and 256 bits. Uh, well, as I said, the AES may work in different modes. Some are better than the others, as you may notice. But basically, AES is still considered to be safe when applied properly with proper modes, which isn't ECB. As you, as you see. Um, and the other notable property is its performance, which is 
really good and I will say about that later, but it's very important for the asymmetrical cryptography. Let's move on to the hash functions then. Um, hash functions are so-called one-way functions, and that means that it is easy to compute the value for a given argument, but it also is infeasible to compute argument based on a given value, right? And important property is that given hash function always returns a value of certain length. All right, so where do we use this? For the password verification. So we don't need to know the password to actually, actually uh, verify if it's correct or not. For the data structures, hash maps, hash tables, we all know them. Integrity check, so we can verify whether the program message or whatever piece of uh, software wasn't changed on the way to the user. And for the algorithms, in this case for the rabin carp algorithm, which is string searching algorithm that actually uses hashing to find patterns in strings. All right, um, here are a couple of properties that a good, well, every hash function should, should have. So it should be very, uh, we, we should be able to compute the hash value quickly for any given message. We shouldn't be able to go back. I mean, given a value, we shouldn't be able to, uh, to generate a message from that. We, should, we also shouldn't be able to modify a message without changing the hash value. And in fact, even a small change to, to the argument should result in completely different hash value. This is very important. And also it should be feasible to find different messages that will give these the same hash value. And let's stop for a little bit uh, at the last one, at the last property. This is very important because imagine that if you have an infinite pool of values, right, and you want to map these values on some finite set, there will be collisions, right? It's just by the law of nature. All right, let's talk about the Fermi paradox. It will show you how it works, the collisions. Well, it turns out that we only need a group of 40 to 50 people to be almost certain that we have a pair of people that have the same birthday and thus we get a collision. Let's take a look at, 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 this, at this graph. When the number of people increases, the probability of collision significant, significantly rises. Note that we only need 20 people to have a 50% probability of getting a collision, right? Not much, knowing that we get 365 days in a year. All right, but okay, let's just, uh, let's just go through the scientific notation of what exactly the collision is. So let's have a function, hash function h that maps set m to set t, and we know that the power of set m is much, much greater than the power of set t. And the collision for this function is a pair of distinct uh, items from the first set, such that the hash values for this is equal, and as I said, the, the inputs are different. But yeah, in reference to hash functions, we talk about collision resistance, which means that it should be extremely difficult to find such collisions. But as I said, keep in mind that they exist just by the law of nature. And so-called birthday paradox places an upper bound on collision resistance, which means that it only, only take two to the power of n by two tries to find a collision. If someone comes up with something faster, 
it is considered a flow uh, hash function, right? So that's, now let's move on to, to the asymmetrical cryptography. And this time we'll be talking about the RSA. There are many different algorithms that represent that particular group, but RSA is just most notable and pretty simple to explain. The algorithm was found by Mr. Rivest, Mr. Shamir and Mr. Adelman. This is where the name comes from, the RSA. And getting to the details, uh, which is very important, the key generation in RSA is a procedure. The key is not a totally random number. It, ha it must have certain properties to work. And so the key generation looks like this. We choose two distinct prime numbers, P and Q, and the thing is that these two numbers must be very large. Then we compute n, uh, then we compute the Euler function, which for prime numbers looks like this. And the Euler function uh, counts the positive integers up to a given integer n, this big n, uppercase, that are relatively prime uh, to a given argument. And this means that their greatest common divisor is equal to one. Then we choose a number e between one and the value of this Euler function, which also needs to be co-prime to v of n. And then we compute d by this formula. When we go through that procedure, we get the pair of keys, the public key, and private key. And the encryption and the encryption decryption functions looks like this. Pretty simple. And as I said uh, previously, regarding the funding part, in this case, we also uh, encrypt and decrypt uh, letter by letter or bit by bit, right? But why is this secure? So the public information that the attacker may get is the ciphertext. He also has the encryption key, the, so the exponent e and the modulus n, because it's the public key. But still, he doesn't know the exponent d. Let's try to do simple mathematics. We also know that the d times e equals 1 modulo v of n, which implies this. We can uh, substitute v of n to this, but hold on, we don't know the p and q, right? And we know that the n equals p times q, but p and q are prime numbers. And in order to get them, we would need to uh, factorize the n number. And it turns out that it is a known problem, which is integer factorization problem. And as we've been talking about <clears throat> the computational complexity, this one has the complexity somewhere around exponential, uh, uh, exponential complexity. So it's really, really tough task to to do this kind of thing. All right, this is why the RSA works basically. And as I said, uh, in the real world usage, uh, when we want to encrypt messages using the RSA, we actually only encrypt the key uh, of the AES algorithm and the message is being encrypted by the AES algorithm. This is because the AES is very quick and the RSA complexity is polynomial. It's much, it, it is much slower than the AES. But if we encrypt the key, it's fair enough. Right. 
let's move to the real time usages of the cryptography hash functions, etc., which in our case will be the blockchain and the Bitcoin. So what is Bitcoin? Uh, as stated on the official website, Bitcoin is an innovative payment network and a new kind of money. So it is a kind of network. And in addition, it is a distributed network. So let's take a look about, uh, at the network types. So in centralized networks, like for example, current banking system, if you think of a single bank and its clients, in this case, if the root is gone, the node zero, the rest of the nodes has no option to communicate and share information. Root is the only source of information and also in this case, a trust party. In decentralized uh, version, there's a little upgrade because if we delete one of the nodes, the other nodes may keep some connectivity with the others, but still they will lose uh, access to some part of the graph. And in the distributed networks, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, these are free from these constraints. If one deletes any node, the other nodes will still find a way to communicate. All right? But how, how does the bit Bitcoin work? So moving on, uh, every Bitcoin user has a wallet, which is basically a pair of keys, public, private, as I described in the previous section. And also a wallet has an address, potentially many addresses, but let's say it has an address. And your actual balance, which means how many Bitcoins you, you have, uh, this is stored in the blockchain nodes. All right, so if you want to make a transaction, you are actually spending all of your Bitcoins on the, transa on the transaction but you choose how many Bitcoins are sent to, to the address of your choice and how many Bitcoins you send back to your own wallet. Plus the transaction is signed with your private key. And this way, the whole info about your balance is stored in a single block of a blockchain, right? Okay, so what is blockchain? So it's basically, uh, register a ledger of transactions and it's immutable. But, all right, how does it work? Well, there are a couple of pieces that put together allow us to use Bitcoin. Um, mentioned before, private public key pairs, the Merkle tree for integrity checks and also for disk, disk space optimization, the hash puzzles, this is the part where actually the miners come in and do their job. I will talk about that more in a minute. And the hash codes for proof of work or transaction slash block identification. All right, let's take a look at the Merkle tree. So it's basically a tree structure that allows us for efficient and secure verification of content. And it looks like this. So basically at the very bottom, we got uh, single transactions and we count hash values of these transa transactions. And then to create a tree structure, we get, we take pairs of these hashes and hash them together. And we move on. Then we hash together next to pairs until we, uh, go through all of the items. Then we do the same uh, operation on the higher level until we get a single hash value. All right, let's go uh, through a simple, simple example. Let's say that these numbers represent our uh, transactions in a blockchain. So we compute the hash value of all of them. Then we compute hash values of the first pair and the hash value of the second pair 
and then we do the same on the higher level. And at the end, we get the Merkle tree root. All right, and this is how the actual block in a blockchain looks like. This part with the transactions, they are actually stored in the Merkle tree that I just described. And in the header, we got the previous block hash, uh, the mentioned list of transaction, but there's also a reward uh, transaction included. This is the reward for a miner that finds a nonce. And I will tell about this nonce in a minute. And at the very end, we got a hash value of of all of the of the information in the in the block, and as you may notice, this hash value has a certain number of number of leading zeros, right? And this is this is where the miners do their job. They randomly try to solve the hash puzzle, which means we got certain value at the very at the beginning. This is our block. The uh, the transactions, our Merkle tree, the header, and we need to find a value, a nonce, that, that if we put it here, we will, uh, it will result in a hash in certain formats that will have a certain amount of leading zeros. Right? And whoever finds this nonce, nonce sorry, that will fill our block, it gets the reward, a determined amount of Bitcoins. And this is basically the only way to create a new Bitcoin. You solve the hash puzzle. And once the block is created, uh, it is broadcast to all of the other nodes in the network. But how do we know if someone really did the job, spent his uh, computational power and found the real nonce, well, we can use hashes, which as we know, they are very easy to cal calculate. And we already know the, uh, w w what's inside the, the block, right? So if the miner provides the computed nonce, we can easily calculate the hash and see if it if it is uh, if it is in certain in certain format, all right. And when the block is broadcasted, when that happens, it is said that the transaction has been mined at a depth of one block. And with each subsequent block that is found, the number of blocks uh, deep is increased by one. And to be secure against double spending of your Bitcoins, a transaction should, should not be considered as, as confirmed until it is a certain number of blocks deep. And in a real world, it is uh, like six blocks. This will give you almost 100% certainty that your transaction was accepted. All right. There are couple of uh, things that are nice to know, that the hash puzzle is getting harder, which means at, the, at this moment, uh, the hash puzzle involves hashes that have 18 leading zeros, and periodically they are getting harder because more and more miners are involved and the overall uh, computational power is increasing. So the number of leading zeros is also increased uh, with time. And as I said, it takes approximately six blocks to give you almost certain certainty that your transaction was accepted. Uh, <clears throat> plus, if there are multiple blockchain versions broadcasted to the network, the longest is accepted. Uh, let's assume that two miners found uh, nonce in the very same time. 
and they broadcast their results. So then in a distributed network, when the other nodes are updating their current blockchain, um, well, certain, um, I mean, the, with time, one of these, uh, of these blockchains will, will be longer, right? Like more nodes will choose certain, certain blockchain and the longest will be accepted since it's the one that, uh, that needed the most computational power to, to be created. All right, and it's also uh, good to know that there will be only 21 million Bitcoins. And this is because of the fact that, as I said, you can only create new Bitcoins by solving the hash puzzles. And it started, the, the first block uh, of the Bitcoin blockchain started without any transaction, just with the 50 Bitcoins of a reward. And periodically, uh, there's something called halving. And when the halving comes, the reward is being divided by two. So as you may notice in time, it will, it will be divided by two, by two, by two, until uh, the, reward will, the, the reward will, will be worthless. All right, thank you for your attention. Anyone has any questions? Uh, thanks, it was very interesting. I, I would love to read more about that uh, one time pad thing. Never heard of it before. All right, yeah, it's very interesting. And if you people will want, I may prepare separate lectures about each part of this uh, brief glimpse uh, at the cryptography. I mean, we yeah. can split yeah, up the, can. the topics and go into details. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I feel like uh, blockchain, blo <laughs> blockchain block uh, deserves much more time. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We were talking about just Bitcoins in, in this example. Uh, yeah, there right. is a little bit more that we could talk about. Uh, Bitcoins are the most popular, though. Uh, most, well, most I was uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say real quick that while I was studying at uh, Union Factory, I actually wrote one project where I had to like recode a couple of uh, SSL functions. So I kind of familiar with. Uh, well, all that stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting stuff. Huh. We could uh, do a little bit of checkup. How feasible would it be to use lambdas to blockchains <laughs> or to bitcoins? Let's see if we can make money out of that. Probably not anymore. Okay. Any other questions? Anything else, Pavel, to add from your side? Well, no, just thank you for listening and hopefully there will be will to uh, hear more about details in whatever topic that was mentioned. We can yeah, even... I just, posted, I just yeah. posted a Medium article on Dev Internal. It's absolute minimum. Every web developer should know about cryptography. So feel free to add something that we should be aware of like working as web developers all right okay uh just one thing uh we'll follow up with you guys with the uh, uh how it's called a uh, quick form for your feedback that it's going to be anonymous uh so we want to get better at preparing those uh those things for you Cool. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, they're recording the shirt anywhere uh, on our Slack.
uh, it's going to be shared on our Slack, but it also is going to be shared uh, probably on our uh, social medias. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks.